Now, the bacterial 70S ribosome unit, this is something that you have all read in your biology textbooks, maybe even in high school, I don't know. And uh, since many of you may be attracted to structural biophysics and may have heard about the work of Adayonath and Venki Ramakrishnan, you at least have read about this subunit. Certainly, it's important as a marker for phylogenetic analysis in terms of the RNA sequence. But suffice to say that we will try to look at it from a sedimentation perspective because that S is something we want to know. What does it tell us? What, what does it mean ribosome, large ribosome subunit of E. coli is 70 S, right? That's the question we want to answer. So let's go at it. So by definition, we say that one Swedberg unit is equal to 10 to the power minus 13 seconds. This is a constant and this is defined from here, right? Now, Swedberg, by the way, in fact, obtained, was awarded the 1962 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for his invention of the ultra centrifuge. Some of you, again, in biology labs may have had the good fortune of seeing one or using one even. Those of you who have not, you are welcome to go back and read the Nobel lecture because all these are online. Because it tells us a lot about the fact that many people at the big early days of modern biology were inventors. They were making things because when they faced a problem, when they saw something that was not functioning or did not address the need that they had for, uh, for doing a certain kind of experiments, they made up a device. They invented a device. And so this is something that you can also do especially if you know the principles. And I know sometimes you feel, oh, I'm not an engineer. Oh, I'm not a physicist. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a mechanics uh, trained person. I'm not a technician. But you have to be curious and you talk to the right people and you can figure this out, okay? Um, because the means are today so easy that you can actually be both a scientist and inventor. So in addition to gravity, um, when we centrifuge the sample, we add acceleration to it. And this is acceleration due to nothing but centrifugal energy. This is why it's called a centrifuge. If I if I take a thread and I swing it, you see that the, the thread becomes horizontal to the axis of, uh, to, to the plane of our uh, planet, which means that it is again acting against gravitational acceleration. It's in fact opposing, successfully opposing the motion. You know this when you were on a merry-go-round and you went very, very fast, you were hanging out at times, right? So, centrifugal force can be very powerful. It can even be more powerful than the gravitational acceleration, the thing that keeps us on the ground. Um, so, acceleration due to centrifugation, by definition, means that S is equal to Vd by A, um, where A is now whatever factor of gravitational acceleration that we are interested in. Means that we can rewrite this as Vd, that is downward velocity, is equal to S into A. And if we assume for a moment, that A is equal to 1 centimeter per second square, then Vd um, is 10 to the power minus 13 centimeters per second. Yeah. So for an acceleration of 1 centimeter per second square, downward velocity will be 10 to the power minus 13 centimeters per second. Again, this is coming from definition of Swedberg unit. But the bacterial ribosome subunit is 70s. So what will the rate of sedimentation be? This is what we asked ourselves. So we need a few numbers. We need uh, gravitational acceleration. All of us know it's 9.8 meters per second square or 980 centimeters per second square. I'm going to use the CGS units for the moment. By definition, V downward is equal to S into A, as we said. So the 70s becomes 70s into 10 to the power 5 uh, G. And uh, because we are centrifuging it at 1 lakh G, that is 10 to the power 5 G. Uh, this is what an ultra centrifuge can achieve, by the way. Um, and that is why they are expensive. That is why they need good maintenance. And uh, they need uh, modern ultra centrifuges have very sophisticated uh, circuits to evac to create a vacuum, um, very high vacuum in millibar ranges of pressure. And uh, they have uh, very well uh, lubricated uh, rotors. The centrifuges are made of light but strong uh, alloys, typically aluminium. And uh, the tubes are standardized so that there are almost no imbalances. When you are at that speed, even tiny imbalances can cause catastrophic damage, right? Because uh, this is partly why what we call balancing the tubes is critical in ultra centrifugation. If you thought that running it at 5000 um, G was bad enough, think about it that you're going at 1 lakh. 
Okay. Uh, so, so in this case, uh, we substitute the numbers V D is equal to seven T S into ten to the power five G, and we get an answer, which is that V D is equal to ten to the power minus three centimeters per second, which is approximated from the exact answer, which is six point eight six into ten to the power minus four centimeters per second. However, thermal diffusion ha also has velocity associated with it, and we'll come back to this later. But just to remind you. The velocity of the RMS velocity, the thermal motion, random motion, Brownian motion of a particle means that at any given instant, any object has a certain velocity by which it will move, which is proportional to the thermal energy, ambient energy, which is given by the Boltzmann's constant or the universal gas constant and is inversely proportional to the mass. When we substitute the numbers for a 70s ribosome subunit based on its molecular weight, we get a RMS velocity of 10 to the power to 100 centimeters per second. Now, please compare this 10 to the power minus 3 centimeters per second to 100 centimeters per second. That is to say, 1000th of a centimeter per second is the RMS velocity, I'm sorry, is the downward velocity, whereas 100 centimeters per second, that is to say, uh, 10,000 times larger is the RMS velocity than the centrifugal velocity. So, that means we should never be able to centrifuge because the velocity of one is much greater than the other. Um, the funny part is that centrifugation still works. So, if we go to a lab and do the experiment and I will not be able to show you that, but I will do a demonstration uh, to suggest that sedimentation works and so we know this. So, why? why? Why does it work when all these other factors seem to affect it? It turns out that random walks and Brownian motion, which we will have an opportunity to discuss in great detail in the next section, are non-directional, they do not have any sustained direction in which they work. As a result, even though the mo motion is very fast, it is undirected and over time it has very little or no effect on the motion of these particles, so long as there is a sustained downward velocity due to centrifugation or sedimentation as the case might be. So, to summarize, the proportionality of the Swedberg unit, uh, Swedberg constant is directly proportional to the effective mass, directly proportional to diffusion coefficient and inversely proportional to the drag coefficient. In a sense, the drag coefficient is a measure not just of the viscosity, but also the shape of the object. So, if, a, if two particles have the same effective mass, but one is more compact than the other, then, the, then, then it will have a lower effective drag coefficient and therefore, it will be faster at sedimenting or a higher S rate because of the shape of the object itself. So, we go on to acceleration due to centrifugation. This is a practical aspect which I just want to highlight here is illustrated in this display. So, this is a display of an ultra centrifuge. You remember I mentioned vacuum. So, the vacuum that the ultra centrifuge can exert is up to 1.1 micrometers um, mercury height. Um, it also gives you time. It gives you the temperature. So, they are also cooling because at lower temperatures, there is less chance of thermal motion. So, you cool them. So, you improve your sep separation. We will get to that in a minute. And you can set the speed. And the speed can be set in terms of RPM, that is rotations per minute or RCF. And this is the subject of what I want to talk about for this segment right now. Okay. So, acceleration is, can be considered to be a factor of the gravitational acceleration that is A is equal to N into G. N is the number of fold of G. So, many typically if you ask uh, people who are working with centrifugation for many years, uh, how many Gs are you centrifuging for? This is the typical answer that they will get all the, the dadas and didis, the, the PhD students, postdocs, scientists who work in a lab. Um, and, um, and this is important because uh, this is a, this is a exactly what I was saying earlier a factor of the gravitation. How many times of gravitational acceleration are you using? Because we know that gravitational acceleration is constant, it is universal. Um, so, centrifugal acceleration itself, that is to say how fast you, um, um, how, how much acceleration you get in terms of a centrifuge is dependent on r into omega square, where omega is the angular velocity of rotation. You remember your high school physics. Um, which is in terms of radians per second. So, RPM stands for rotations per minute and RPS stands for rotations per second. This is kind of obvious answer. One is in terms of per unit minute and the other is in terms of per unit second, which means one RPM 
corresponds to 60 rps obviously right um omega is equal to 2 pi into rotations per second yeah um now we want to know what is the conversion of this g g factor how many g's from rpm so in order to do that we need to equate rcf and rpm if you google search this question you will come up with a lot of manufacturers of centrifuges thermoscientific uh, beckman coulter and companies um who have put these numbers online and they tell you rcf is equal to rpm square into 1.118 into 10 to the power minus 5 into r how did they get this number <laughs> yeah how how so that's what we're going to try to explain in terms of a derivation um, r here is the rotational radius in centimeters meaning to say if your rotor is 1 centimeter or rather the sample is held at 1 centimeter from the center of rotation or 1 meter from the center of rotation that is what this r is defining for you uh, so a is equal to r omega square this is from simple rotational motion as we said earlier equation number 2 and when we substitute omega as 2 pi rps which we said is by definition from equation 3 then we end up with the possibility to now write out the conversion from rpm to rps yeah as i said uh, it's 60 60 rps is 1 rpm therefore rps is rpm type by 60 and substituting we get um because we want to convert rpm to rcf remember um so we substitute and we get uh, a is equal to 2 pi square whole square rpm square by 60 square all this leaves us with a number which is a is equal to 4 pi square upon 36000 3600 sorry into r into rpm square rcf on the other hand um rotational centrifugal force is nothing but the fold g of acceleration we said that right how many g's remember um so when we now take this equation and uh, say therefore that a is equal to rcf into 980 centimeters square per second using cgs units then rcf into 980 centimeters square per second is equal to 4 pi square upon 3600 into numerator r into rpm square rearranging the terms with rcf on the left side gives us 1.1198 10 to the power minus 5 you can use your calculators to check into r into rpm square this is how we get the number all right so we now have a conversion factor for relative gravitational acceleration rcf and rpm and if you want if you know the rpm you can get your rcf and if you need to know the rpm for a known rcf you need to rearrange and take square roots on the right side okay so this is your simple derivation of a very practical use and day to day requirement for centrifugation and ultra centrifugation so what are the types of ultra centrifugation methods that we can typically see so the two that we are going to discuss right now are isopicnic and rate zonal so in isopicnic the idea is that you can centrifuge a mixed sample based on the fact that you already know that the particle that you want to centrifuge let us say it is nuclear you have you have crushed some cancer cells you made a lysate so resuspended it in buffer and you know that the nucleus has a different buoyancy as compared to the membrane as compared to the endoplasmic reticulum as compared to the golgi so knowing this if you now centrifuge this mixture fast enough over time you will get different zone different uh, uh, regions in which the different organelles will form and this is allowing you to separate them out on the other hand rate zonal centrifugation says that the density of different reagents let us say ficol or sucrose can be used to find that position at which the density is matched to the object that you're trying to separate in a way we know that the density of the object and the density of the fluid are related to the buoyancy so you could argue that these two methods are not very different from each other but in terms of practical implementation in rate zonal centrifugation we layer our sample on top of the gradient over here where you see the yellow mark and then centrifuge it so over time we get clean zones that differentiate the different segments that we want to look at this assumes that you know that the object that you're trying to centrifuge let us say chloroplast from plant cell extracts that they come at a certain density their density matched 
concentration of icol or sucrose must be present in your gradient so that you can then go back and take it out and you need some spectral methods to test whether what you have done is correct right so that was regard to two typical methods of ultra centrifugation finally i want to talk a little bit about the precision of centrifugation and what can cause differences in how well we separate a material so the answer to that lies in the question how clear are the boundaries between the separated regions uh, when you take out a tube and you look and you have like we talked about at the beginning about sedimentation of red blood cells or blood cells from blood uh, we see clear separation boundaries uh, we expect to see clear separation boundaries so in this sense uh, what we do not want to see is smearing over time so if you leave that tube for a while you expect that the boundaries will uh, blur from one another and uh, we know that the separation distance is proportional to the centrifugation time and for diffusion it is proportional to the square root of the centrifugal uh, of the time meaning to say it is slower right with the same amount of time it only increases as a square root of it so if if in 4 uh, seconds the separation distance increases by a factor of 4 then the diffusion uh, causes a separation in by a factor of 2 yeah slower um how can we improve separation the simple answer is to increase the strength of the separation field um because diffusion coefficient size and centrifugal uh, force or tendency are interrelated to each other so for globular struct proteins of a shape that we can approximate as a sphere we can say that the effective mass of the sphere is equal to mass the intrinsic mass of the sphere minus the uh, fluid density and the volume and uh, the fluid density itself is in terms of uh, in terms of the difference between the uh, i'm sorry the effective mass of the sphere is in terms of the product of the volume and the difference between the solid density and the fluid density which if we substitute for a sphere the um, volume of the sphere equation 4/3 pi r cube uh, using r as the radius we get a downward velocity of centrifugation which is f down by f which is m prime g upon 6 pi eta r stokes drag coefficient in the denominator and m prime g in the numerator substituting this equation into 2 we get a substitution which looks a uh, little messy but if you write it out you should be able to check that the downward velocity of a sphere is equal to 2 into r square upon 6, 9 eta all into the product of the difference between the solid and fluid uh, densities multiplied by the g so this is why ultra centrifugation is so useful because you get higher g's you get higher acceleration so you are directly proportional to the velocity of downward motion so with that we end this segment on centrifugation and i'm going to summarize what we have covered so far so in summary the downward velocity of centrifugation is equal to the effective velocity effective mass into gravitational acceleration to diffusion coefficient upon kbt this is swedberg's equation swedberg's unit is s is equal to 10 to the power minus 13 seconds this is by definition vd by g is s which is the swedberg uh, symbol the 70s ribosome is based on the speed at which it centrifuges in a certain um gravitational acceleration and the acceleration of the centrifugation we said can be used to infer interrelationships between rcf rpm and how many g's rate zonal and isopycnic centrifugation are used differentially depending on whether we know the buoyancy or the density of the object and we can also infer that we can improve the precision of separation through higher forces of centrifugation <laughs>